Let's not strangle the child today, Simon. Come on, fact boy. It's not time for this. That's a lie. Um, you what? What's good, legends? This video is brought to you by Surfshark. I'm sure they have an excellent deal for you. It's a VPN, which you should probably get for both security and watching Netflix shows that you're not allowed to watch in other countries. Apparently, I'm allowed to say that in the ad read. Netflix doesn't seem to care. There's a link below. More on them in a bit. Uh, when terrible toys turn bad. Oh, sh**. I know what this story is about. There was a, I think it was a Polish toy or some like that that was made in China. Or something, I'm just cleaning my glasses because they're very dirty. Uh, that was made in China that started singing some Polish rap or something about cocaine. And it's for kids. And it's just rapping in Polish. And I'm like, that is absolutely amazing. Wish I could jump in there and roll around in all that cascading white powder. Yeah, just get high in all of life's splendor. So I'm excited to get into that. Uh, everyone on the internet, people probably watching this being like, that was my idea, that was my idea. Maybe it was, but a thousand people literally hit me up on Twitter about the cocaine toy. So uh, yeah, you're welcome everybody. It was all your idea, yes you. Yes you, I'm addressing you personally right now. You're welcome. Maybe you can support this show that is so personally catered to your needs by purchasing the merch, I heart generic bald YouTubers. Why not, eh? Babby Town of bric a doesn't appear on any map and it's invisible to anyone who has passed the age of not believing. Ah, Danny, no one believes in that nonsense. Ah, it's like Father Christmas, that gobbledygook. For this is the secret domain of the toy makers and it's a place of wonder and magic driven by an economy rooted in childhood innocence powered by two AA batteries, which are probably not included because they never were. My, I believe I've mentioned this before. My parents were such legends. And this is like just one of those little things where it's like if the toy didn't come with batteries, they would take it out of the box, they would put the batteries in there, and they'd put it back in the box. Or if it was a remote control car or something, they would buy like an extra battery and they would charge up both the batteries so I could play with it. And I'm like, that is really nice. Thank you, parents. You legends. I'm the cool dad. That's, that's my thing. We're all in this together. Yes, we are. In a tiny clockwork cottage with a chocolate chimney and candy drain pipes, the most respected toy maker in bric a brac sits down on a mushroom stool and takes a welcome puff on a pipe which blows out strawberry <laughs> bubbles. This place sounds horrible. I know it's supposed to be great and it's like childhood fantasy land. It's like, woo, look how great it is. And I'm like, just as an adult, it's like, oh, that sounds so cringe. It's like, it's like heaven. You know, like the actual idea of heaven. It's like, yeah, there are cherubs with little wings and you're in a cloud and St. Peter's there and everyone's happy. And I'm like, that sounds like f***ing, that just sounds horrible, doesn't it? That's not my idea of heaven at all. My idea of heaven would be like, it's got an Xbox, right? We can still get beer in heaven, right? Am I, am I currently alive friends and family going to be there? Because I'd miss them, but I also don't want them to die. Heaven is so confusing. I'm glad I don't believe in any of that shit. This guy is a good toy maker, an innovative and imaginative toy maker, a celestial toy maker. And it is something like a baby's teething toy, or it's a ring, I don't know what it is. Although he never takes the credit for any of his inventions, this was the bloke who came up with Buckaroo, Hot Wheels, Mr. Potato Head, Hungry Hippos, and Tickle Me Elmo. I've heard of all of those except for Buckaroo. I don't know what Buckaroo is. Meanwhile, at the other end of the idyllic town, another toy maker lives in a derelict castle with a sign on the door which reads, Beware of the golden poison dart frogs. Oh my! He takes another swig from his can of super strength lager and then spits it out on the stone floor in disgust when he suddenly remembers that he'd been using the can as an ashtray. Ah, oh, that's terrible. The only thing worse would be like, if a, you know when you've got a can of coke and a wasp goes in there? And like summer picnics, I live in fear of those waspies in the drinks. Is he like, ah, why waspy, why? You were trying to eat me, Simon. You were trying to eat me. Waspinator, quit! As of now, which means Edbot and two heads can just pucker their mandibles and plant big wet juicy one right here on Waspinator's big fat stripey. This guy isn't such a good toy maker. He's got sausage fingers and no patience, and he really doesn't give a shit. 
This was the bloke who came up with the Hasbro Easy Bake Oven, the Gay King Cockering Doll. Oh my god, OGBB! Which is a t-shirt that is unavailable because you didn't get in early enough, did you? Did you? I'm so disappointed. You can get the generic. Did I did I mention the generic balls at purchasemerch.co for Columbia or cocaine, whatever you prefer? The Harry Potter vibrating broomstick and the E.T. finger lights. Oh my. Oh, gee, bee, bee. And he brings embarrassment and shame to the otherwise proud town of Bric-a-Brac because for every creative and stimulating toy dreamed up by the good toy maker. There's always an ilk and Danny. You shouldn't be writing for business place. You should be writing kids' movies, apparently, because this is some crazy ass sh <laughs> Offensive or downright dangerous toys, play toy dangerous plaything cooked up by the lousy toy maker, which turns a typical childhood Christmas stocking into an X-rated death trap. Gilbert's Atomic Energy Laboratory. I might have been one of the few kids in the UK to never have a go at playing with a chemistry set. I did. I loved that chemistry set. I never had one myself, and though most of my mates had them, the chemistry set was never top of the pile when it came for me choosing what to play with. Maybe it's because it would have felt too much like faffing about, or too much like being in the classroom and learning something useful. A chemistry set could never hope to compete with the scare electrics or Operation, or Kaplunk. Uh, from 1909 to 1967, the A.C. Gilbert Company developed a reputation for flogging semi-educational kits, which were designed for the studious child who enjoyed scientific and practical journeys over discovery over a quick game of Guess Who. And one of the company's most n notable kits emerged during the dawn of the atomic age when, in 1951, Gilbert released the U-238 Atomic Energy Laboratory. That sounds like a brilliant idea. What should we give the kids to play with? Radiation. In a bid to get young kids interested in creating chemical reactions and measuring atomic radiation from the safety of their bedrooms, the full kit included a Geiger counter, an electroscope, a spintheroscope, okay, used to observe atoms decay, and four glass jars of radioactive ore samples containing good old uranium, that well-known staple of traditional children's toys, which is also used on the side to power, yes, atomic bombs. Oh my god. <laughs> Uranium might sound like a lethal ingredient to find in a kid's playset, but the instructions did come with a brief warning. Users should not take ore samples out of their jars, for they tend to flake and crumble, and you would run the risk of having radioactive ore spread out in your laboratory. Or else you will die. This sounds like some fallout You know, from the, that's why I read in that kind of like old school fallout voice, you know, uh, where he's like looking through the past and the kids are playing with radio. I, you know, you know what I mean, right? Am I, I mean, it's a long time since I played fallout, but that was kind of the vibe, right? It's always a pain when your grumpy parents start nagging you to tidy up your bedroom and get rid of all this bloody radioactive ore. The <laughs> Clean up your room, Timmy! It stinks of radiation! The U-238 Atomic Energy Laboratory was on sale for less than a year before it was discontinued, but this had nothing to do with any safety concerns. It's just that the kit was a massive flop, shifting less than 5,000 units in total, and all of them were sold to terrorists. <laughs> Not really. And this was just entirely down to the utterly ridiculous price tag. The kit went on sale for just under $50, which would work out at over $500 in today's money. Holy sh**. If I was getting a $500 gift, it would not be a chemistry set. It would be like something cool. And not that chemistry isn't cool. Learning's cool. Why am I lying? Um... <laughs> But it has to be said that although the U-238 Atomic Energy Laboratory tops lists for the most dangerous toys in history, it probably wasn't that bad. The journal IEEE Spectrum declared in 2020 that any radiation exposure from the small uranium ore samples would have been equivalent to a day of UV exposure from the sun. You probably wouldn't feel very well if you ingested the stuff. I mean, who? <laughs> Kids never eat anything that they find that they're not supposed to eat, do they? Ever. Never happens. But you probably wouldn't feel very well if you tried eating Mr. Potato Head either. However, perhaps there was a bigger risk of uranium ingestion back then during the golden age of comics when kids were mesmerized by tale of superheroes getting incredible powers from experiments with radiation. When they go tits up, little Bobby might have been tempted to take a swig from the jars just to see if it helped guide him along his ultimate destiny, destiny of evolving into Hedgehog Man. The best of all the men. Forget Spider-Man and Superman. What do you are? Hedgehog Man. What's that comedy sketch with this moth man? <laughs> and he's just constantly bashing his head into lights like, mwah. Holy shit! It's a mother effing moth, man! Are you kidding me? The thing is, though, this Atomic Energy Commit Laboratory wasn't even the most dangerous kit by the AC Gilbert Company. Their chemistry sets once included poison and elements of gunpowder. Brilliant. <laughs> 
And so what's this? It's the Cyanide Play Kit. Oh, brilliant! What's this one? Yeah, that's the Biological Novichok set. Okay. Their caster kits from 1931 encourage kids to create their own little metal cast figurines and toys by pouring pots of molten lava lead lava into molds. That sounds extremely dangerous. And their 1920 glass blowing kits gave kids the chance to create their very own containers by heating glass to a thousand degrees Fahrenheit and then blowing the scorching hot molten glass into shape or without the need of any safety equipment as your bare hands were deemed adequate for the job. Ah, people in the past had proper hands, not like today's snowflake hands. Am I right, Pisa? I have a present for you. Apparently, the founder of the A.C. Gilbert Company was a former athlete and magician. I strongly suspect that he really had something against kids. You know what doesn't have something against kids? Today's glorious sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Yes, guys! What's the crack with Surfshark VPN? Well, look, if you're buying crack online, you should pro probably can't say that. Don't buy drugs on the internet. It's dangerous and a crime. Guys, don't do crimes. Talked about this. Simon also... Don't make, put them in ad reads. You're gonna get in trouble. <laughs> buh, 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 FBI! Look, you use the internet. I know you do. You're using the internet right now, and your internet experience will improve with Surfshark VPN. Let me tell you how. Look, I don't wanna I don't wanna insult your intelligence because I'm generally assuming, look, if you're out and about and you see like an unsecured Wi-Fi, you don't just immediately jump onto that and be like, ooh, hoo, hoo, free internet. It's not 2010, guys and girls. Um, it's 2021. And, uh, well, you've probably got really good internet on your phone anyway. But if you're like, oh, I don't want to use all my data, so let's get on that free Wi-Fi. Absolutely fine. Absolutely fine. But do make sure you're using a VPN because, look, you don't want people getting into your shit. Like, if that's an unsecured network, my understanding of it is, and look, I'm not a technological wizard, but that's basically someone could be monitoring that traffic. And if you're logging into your internet banking or your PayPal or... What's that big famous American one that everyone talks about that I can't use? for sending money to your friends. Venmo, Venmo. If you're using your Venmo, don't be doing that. I don't know, just don't do anything with money or like private shit without using a VPN. It just doesn't make sense. But also it's not just security. It's not just security. That would be a lie. It's also about increasing your options online. And Netflix is the big one because did I talk before how I wanted to watch a bunch of Mission Impossible movies ahead of the new Mission Impossible movie coming out? And I was like, well, you know, do what I normally do. Fire up my VPN to get my Netflix over to it. I'm just going to say allegedly fire up my VPN, get over to America because they have the best selection. And I was like, bro, American Netflix, why don't you have any Tom Cruise movies? So I turn off my VPN and I'm like, let's give that another crack. And for whatever magical reason, all of the Tom Cruise Mission Impossible movies are available where I live in Prague in the Czech Republic, but not on glorious American Netflix. And I'm like, that's truly bizarre. So if you're like, I want to watch all those Tom Cruise movies, get a VPN, jump over to here, and you can watch them. It's amazing. That's what Surfshark's good for. All that stuff. It's also unlimited, so you can watch in like 4K and stuff if they have it available, and if you pay for Netflix 4K, which I do because it's glorious. Um, and all of that glorious stuff. Yeah, and there's no logs. <laughs> be a weird, bit weird to be like, yeah, it's a, a VPN. But they keep loads of logs, and they spy on you. They don't do that. That would be a lie. 30 days money back guarantee, get 83% off and 3 months free through the link in the description below. Or just go to surfshark.deals forward slash blazed. Yes! Jibba jabba. As a very young child, I always found the most disturbing toy in my collection to be the Jack in the Box. I loved it when I pressed the button which would make the grinning clown figure pop up from the box in noisy jubilation. My version of the toy also had another button which would make the clown say thank you repeatedly. Jack seemed genuinely grateful to have been liberated from his box prison. But the problem was that he started screaming and wailing whenever you tried to push him back into the box. Oh god. I couldn't help but find this deeply traumatic. I didn't want to do this to poor Jack. In the end, I had to leave him permanently standing up in the box, which kind of took away the whole point of the toy. No, Dad, I think that says a lot about you, Danny, as a person. It tells me you're a good person with a good heart. And you were very kind to inanimate objects. I'm sure we're generally meant to be nice to our toys. Everyone remembers Andy's next door neighbor, Sid, from the original Toy Story movie. He was possibly one of the most villainous characters in cinema history, purely because of the sadistic manner in which he treated his toys. 
and this is why the whole concept behind Jibber Jabber Dolls was more than a little surprising. Released in the mid-1990s by the US toy company Ertl, the Jibber Jabber Dolls were long, slinky, funky-haired figures that looked as if they might have escaped from a Mad Max movie. Available in a range of different colors, the most distinctive features of the dolls was their extraordinarily long necks. And this was important. Tell me why, Danny! Because the idea, thank you, was to grab hold of the neck and start choking the doll, which caused it to emit a distressed wailing sound. That's f***ed up. A bit like a groan tube, before eventually falling silent after you'd successfully drained all the life from the doll. Is this a, is this a toy to simulate murder? What the f***? So the kids of the day were being encouraged to strangle their dolls to death and not to get too distracted by the choking cries of despair as it struggled to breathe. This is f***ed up, isn't it? The main initial concern came from the US Advisory Board on Child Abuse and Neglect, who felt that the toys also encouraged kids to shake their baby siblings to death. But Ertl had an answer for that. Rather than withdraw the toys from sale, they threw in a weighty pamphlet which told children all about shaken baby syndrome, and even listed some practical steps on how to react positively to a child crying rather than resorting to strangulation. Ah oh, yes, because when my child dries up, I, well, immediately I go to strangulation, and then I just have to rein myself in a little bit and be like, let's not strangle the child today. <laughs> Simon, come on, fact boy, it's not time for this. That's a lie. Um, you what? But still, it seemed quite odd that Ertl was issuing all of this advice inside a range of toys that were crying out to be choked to death. Sounds like they're covering their bottoms, doesn't it, Danny? The jibber jabbers completely disappeared within the space of a couple of years. I'm surprised they lasted that long, and we haven't seen their likes since. But it's possible that Ertl may just be focusing on the wrong target audience. Something like this would have made a perfect corporate executive toy or a stress reliever. Having a day at work just had another row with your buffoon of a boss strangle this toy to death and the rest of the day will seem much brighter does that actually work i remember when stress relievers were a thing they were like, like these squidgy things that you could squidge and i'm like that does really just go for a run i don't know have a beer take some drugs smoke some crack don't do that don't do that unless you <laughs> you what jots Lawn games often tend to be quite dangerous by their very nature. I don't ever recall playing a game of swing ball that didn't end up with someone running off in tears because they'd just been whacked in the face by a spongy ball. Ah, yes, I loved swing ball, though. But perhaps the most dangerous lawn game of all was jarts. During a typical barbecue in the 1980s back garden, whilst the grown-ups would be burning burgers to a crisp, the little kiddies would be left to throw heavy spiked weapons all over the place before the inevitable bloodbath put a premature halt to the sizzling summer fun. It's not a summer barbecue unless someone ends up in the hospital. Jarts was a kind of mashup of darts and the old horseshoes game in which players tossed horseshoes at stakes in the grounds. Each pack of jarts usually came with a large plastic hoop which was used as a ground target and a few 12 inch solid metal darts with plastic fins which helped them soar through the air like a 17th century fox. That is a callback to a, an old video, Danny. Oh, gee, baby! The heavily weighted darts had metal spikes at the bottom, and the idea was to throw the darts at the hoop from a distance of about 35 feet and try to get them to land somewhere inside the target with a satisfying crunch as the spike sticks firmly into the lawn. I have to say, I get why this game is popular. This does sound fun. Jarts, sometimes known as lawn darts or javelin darts, first started appearing in toy shops from the 1950s and was produced by a wide range of different manufacturers. They had the peak of popularity in the 1980s, which is a bit strange because they weren't even meant to be legally sold as toys at that time. Ah, yes. You'd be like, what is that in the toy store? Ah, yes, that is jarts, also known as lawn darts. It's a, uh, uh, it's a lawn aeration device. The, uh, it goes into the lawn and aerates it. Definitely not for playing with. You'd never play with that. Am I right? Ah, uh, ah, uh, don't play. But I wanna it hadn't taken too long for people to figure out that getting kids to throw big metal spiky things around the garden could potentially get a little bit dangerous. The actual spikes weren't particularly sharp, but the problem was that if you threw the weighted jar with enough force, it could penetrate a child's skull. If your aim was a bit off, that's pretty intense. Before the founding of the US Consumer Product Safety Commission in 1972, the Food and Drug Administration was slightly weirdly in charge of this kind of thing, and they ruled in 1970 that jarts could no longer be sold in toy stores and should be packaged with warnings to keep these mechanical hazards out of the reach of. Oh shit, I'm sorry. 
and should be packaged with warnings to keep these mechanical hazards out of the reach of children. But this didn't prove very effective, as throughout the 1970s and 80s, there were a reported 6,100 cases of jar-related injuries in the US alone, nearly all relating to kids. Those idiots! Many were left with serious wounds, permanent disabilities. Oh, now I feel a bit insensitive. And there were even three fatalities. And it was a tragic fatality in 1987 that finally took jarts out of the hoop for good. An old, unused set of jarts had been left lingering in the garage of aerospace engineer David Snow from Riverda Riverside, California. His nine-year-old son and his mates from next door had been excited to come across the set and play with them for the first time. But it ended in horror when a stray jart landed on the head of his seven-year-old sister with 23,000 pounds of pressure per inch. Per inch she was pronounced clinically dead three days later. David Snow campaigned for a complete ban on the sale of jarts, and during the very same week in 1988, the CSPC were preparing to vote on the issue. Yes, yet another jarts. And yet another jart. Excuse me, what are you doing? And during the very same week in 1988 that the CSPC were preparing to vote on the issue, yet another jarts fatality was reported. Since then, jarts has been banned outright in the US, but remain completely legal in Europe, where, not quite, where we're not quite so fussy about bodies building up at the barbecues. Like I said, it's not a good party, summer barbecue party, unless someone ends up in the hospital or dead. You know, where's the fun in that? A nightmare in plastic. Here's a valuable business lesson. Always take a good nosy at the stuff you're acquiring before you commit to buying it. In 2004, the US wholesaler Lysi Corporation were looking for suitably cheap plastic tabs that could be stuffed inside bags of candy as an extra little surprise for the kiddies. They ended up signing a deal with Miami-based L&M Import, who just so happened to have a warehouse full of crap. According to the invoice, the inventory up for grabs included little whistles, figurines, and small plastic swing sets, all of which sounds like the kind of thing you'd expect to find hidden inside a Christmas cracker. All that kind of usual shit. Lysi Corporation snapped up the goodies unseen and then went about packaging them inside bags of candy, which were distributed to more than 14,000 small grocery stores. Across the US. That wasn't the end of a sentence. Uh, most of which were Hispanic or Mexican. But there were two little toys that should have raised more than an eyebrow at some point during the packaging and distribution process. Both of the plastic toys depicted the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in a nice shade of purple. Okay. One of them featured a great big white airplane sandwiched in between the Twin Towers, clearly representing a key moment from the 9-11 terror attacks in plastic toy form. You what? I don't even have words. It's so bizarre. Perhaps even more bizarrely, agreed, the second toy also featured the same Twin Towers, but this time the kids were treated to a figure who looked suspiciously like Osama bin Laden happily swinging between them as if he was having the time of this is so bizarre the time of his life it was apparently it's so absurd it's almost not offensive it's like this is just crazy how dare you these were apparently variants of the plastic swing toy mentioned in the invoice but nobody had bothered to mention that both appeared to be disturbing celebrations of a terrorist attack which had been labeled with a product number 9011 I don't understand how how on earth do you come up with this? It's been suggested that the original manufacturer of the toy was a Mexican company who had been given a brief to create some kind of 9-11 memorial, but had veered somewhat off track. Yes, veered massively off track. Lysi Corporation initially refused to respond to any complaints, bad idea, that the toys might not be entirely appropriate trinkets to shove inside bags of candy, but the national sales manager later announced that the offending bags of candy had been recalled. She said, I hate to blame the importer in the opening line of a statement, which went on to largely blame the importer. <laughs> I hate to blame the importer, but... <laughs> Meanwhile, l are probably still trying to shift those black and white minstrel face masks which have been clawing out the warehouse for years. l &M, what are you up to? <laughs> The singing cactus. Ah, here we are, cocaine cactus. I don't think you ever grow out of the temptation of pressing the big try me button whenever you pass a toy on a store shelf. Back when I used to do real Christmas shopping in real shops instead of just ordering everything online, ah, the past was the worst. I spent most of the time whizzing up and down the aisles, just pressing every button on every singing or talking toy to see what kind of noise it would make. The store assistants sometimes looked a bit grumpy, but I could tell they secretly loved it. And you could often guess the nature of the sound from the face of the toy. Buzz Lightyear is likely to exclaim, to infinity and beyond! A Teletubby delivers a thoughtful, eh, uh oh, a pink panther might emit the famous themed theme tune composed by Henry Mancini. A sooty might just be very quiet. But what kind of song would you expect from a singing cactus? I don't know, maybe something about 
Cocaine, perhaps. After careful consideration, I would have probably gone with either a rendition of the traditional English folk song Green Sleeves or We Are the Sons of the Desert from the 1933 Laurel and Hardy film. Danny, again, you're in the wrong career. This is good, good choices. I, I don't know the last one, but I mean, it'd be a bit weird. I don't know why the cactus would be singing to begin with, to be honest. But Green Sleeves would be. I don't know how Green Sleeves goes. That's Scarborough Fair. Who cares? I'm sure I'll know it when I hear it but not out of a cactus. One of the last things I'd expected to hear from a fun singing cactus marketed at children would have been a Polish rap song about cocaine addiction and death. <laughs> Brilliant. But maybe that's why I don't work in the kids' toy market. The toy in question was an electric furry cactus plush toy standing at 32 centimeters tall, which wiggled and boogied on down to a selection of funky tracks when you press the button. It first hit the news just a few weeks before writing the script in July 2021 when a Polish mother discovered the toy during a shopping trip in the city of Tia Tai Chai Chung in Taiwan. Although variants of the singing cactus can be found online, this particular model was manufactured in China and then found on the shelves of a Carrefour store, a French multinational corporation which does big business in Taiwan. The description of the packaging sounded a little clumsy, but it was clear that the product was intended to be a cute and fun gift for children. It read, Best Birthday Gift for Kids. The cactus will stimulate stimulate children's creativity and will dance for a few hours, bringing the child a happy time in a lifetime. Okay. <laughs> when the Polish mother got home and switched it on, she was surprised to see and hear the cactus bobbing and grooving to the rap song Where is the White Eel by Polish rapper Cypus. The cactus was already gyrating as this opening line of the track belted out from the prickly plant. The only thing in my head is five grams of cocaine. That is a lot of cocaine. Later on in the song, the cactus perfectly captures the concerns of a typical troubled toddler. I think I'm going to die if I don't snort something soon. <laughs> it's not clear if the cactus manages to make it through the whole song, but it would be a shame if the cypress track was cut short as the kids would be missing out on such vital pearls of wisdom as chemistry party. I want to go skiing to the dealer, not the Alps. This come down is awful it's like a locust bit my dick what i dreamed of a van of coke and a gram of heroin just for taste maybe i'll make it maybe i won't i'll just f sell everything in my house well i'm f anyway however i already sold everything this cypress sounds like a big brain doesn't he as this is such a recent story, nobody is quite sure yet what exactly got into the jolly singing cactus. We certainly know what wasn't getting into him. Garfor has promised a full investigation. Apparently, Cypress himself is considering legal action over the unlawful use of his thought-provoking little ditty. It could just be that the meaning of the Polish track was lost in translation and wasn't picked up by anyone manufacturing or testing the product in China or Taiwan because nobody spoke the lingo. Oh shit, I'm sorry. And here I am as a YouTuber being like, if I accidentally play half a second of a song, in one of my videos it's like boom we're taking your money away and this toy manufacturer is like yeah yeah where do you get the songs for the actors well we just rip them off spotify don't we just polish spotify it's like okay that's crazy <laughs> It's bullshit. Or I suppose that there's a slim chance that the Polish mother could be telling porkies or playing a prank. I noticed that some models of the toy come with a short recording feature, which means that she could potentially have slapped a segment of this ode to drug withdrawal onto the Cactus Duke box herself. That would be a bit, like, weird. Like, why would you do that? It's a sh prank. Still, I hope the Cactus manages to come out the other side of his drug addiction hell and maybe start dancing to nicer songs about drowning puppies. I'm sure a certain toy maker from the town of bric a would have given that idea a warty thumbs up. Call back with a bum bum this has been an episode of Business Blaze. Thank you so much for watching. Support the show with Surfshark VPN. Or why not head over to purchasemerch.co and buy yourself this generic bald YouTuber's t-shirt. Brilliant. Thank you for watching. Strawberry Bubbles. This place sounds horrible.